Christy Shriver, and welcome to the How to Love Lit podcast. I'm Gary Shriver. We're glad you're joining us today, and if you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us by giving us a five-star rating on your podcast app such as Apple. Uh, Also consider texting your favorite episode to a friend. That's how we grow. That's right. And today we begin a three-part series where we will explore three historical documents that have fallen into the American literary canon, not just for their historical importance, but also for their literary excellence. And as the history person, I get very excited when history and literature overlap. And uh, today's speech is an incredible example of literature changing the world. That's right. Today, we're going to analyze Patrick Henry's speech to the Virginian Convention. Clearly a persuasive piece of writing. (laughs) Next week, we're going to look at the Declaration of Independence. And finally, we're going to read and discuss the Constitution of the United States, but really from a literary perspective. So I'm very excited to explore these works, not just because they're famous, but because they're rhetorical. And uh, I think I've talked a lot about how I love Uh, analysis of rhetoric. And these are some of the first works in the American canon uh, that kind of fall into that foundational category. We've looked at Frederick Douglass. We've looked at Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But, you know, there's a lot of great rhetoric in the American canon. And I'm excited to have a chance to explore some of these. Uh, Of course, there's a lot that has gone on over the last 200 years plus of American Uh, history, American literature. But in order to understand this particular speech, uh, Gary, take us back uh, 200 years so we can set the stage of the migration. Really, I guess that's where we could start, even though we could start earlier, but we have to start somewhere. So let's start with the migration of European peoples to the Americas. Let's use that as our starting point so we can kind of understand who is this guy, Patrick Henry? Well, in order to do that, we're going to have to go back about 400 years. Oh, sorry. My <laughs> math has never been very good. Because <laughs> the, uh, the ideas uh, go back a long way. And I, I don't want to say this, too. What's really interesting, um, in American history textbooks, Patrick Henry's speech is given only a little bit of space and, and not that often. But in literary textbooks, in your literature books, he gets a, a, a nice big section. So it's interesting how the historical and the, uh, the literary move We kind of emphasize different things. Right, right. You're emphasizing in the literature part, the rhetoric and the, the pathos and, the, and all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to kind of jump in here... The tide of migration from Europe to North America is only one occasion of the restless movements of mankind on this planet. I mean, uh, of course, just on this podcast, we've looked at the Greek spirit as well as the Roman spirit, and most notably represented through the person of Julius Caesar. Uh, But of course, world history is the story of this progression, if you want to call it that, all over the globe. What stands as unique in the North American case and something that was highly unusual, is that the thousands who came to the North American colonies did not only come here to exploit and conquer in the name of the motherland, although that happened, there's little doubt, but strangely, most of the voluntary immigrants did so because they did not like the country they came from, uh, nor many of the patterns of life that had involved there. In the beginning, they were the American colonials were the off-scouring of European society whose condition was so bad that moving to a howling wilderness settlement seemed like a better option than staying in England. How bad does your life have to be for that to be true? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not willing to do it. <laughs> right. True. It's like going to space. <laughs> Well, and and they came to create a a new political and religious world and a new social world. And and although uh, the North American story is not a story of perfect people doing perfect things, I mean, it's it's often bloody and sad. Uh, But what has emerged here after many years of struggle actually has become a notable success story for many others on planet Earth. The ideas that developed over the last three to 400 years have elevated the quality of life for millions today called the United States home. So we want to take the next three weeks to explore three foundational documents 
that reflected these roots and set in motion a system of government that's the basis for the oldest continuous working democracy in the world today. We're going to look at Patrick Henry's fiery speech before the Revolutionary War at the Virginia Convention. Next week, we'll read through the Declaration of Independence. And lastly, we'll look at the United States Constitution. Well, when I think of exploration around the world, of course, I was brought up, uh, as you know, in Brazil and the colonization of Brazil and South America, as we see, especially with the conquistadors, is is very different than what we see here in North America. And that's also true, you know, for the migration movements around Africa and all those places. And it, just to compare to Brazil, when I what I learned as a child is the colonizers, for the most part, were companies, men that were employed and they were coming across the ocean, basically to look for gold, wood, and other natural resources, really not with an idea of sticking around long term. And that is a a very significant difference with the uh, colonial experience in North America. I mean, uh, uh, well, don't think that didn't happen in North America, too, because it's part of our story. Uh, Four of the 13 colonies in North America owed their origins to trading companies. Uh, The English and the Dutch and the Swedes, they all christened settlements that eventually became colonies. So we do have that. We also have this unusual religious foundation that we don't commonly see in other colonization movements. And in the case of this part of North America, it was the most influential faction. There were at least 20,000 pilgrims alone who came over in this wave. And I know lots of people are familiar with the Mayflower Compact, which is a very famous document and one of the foundational documents for what will become the Constitution eventually. Um, And it's put together by the pilgrims of Massachusetts. But Rhode Island and Connecticut and New Hampshire sprang directly from religious congregations. And besides the religious settlements, we have Georgia, which is actually founded as a penal colony for English prisons. Uh, Mostly those were people who were imprisoned for large amounts of debt. And then there were five colonies who were proprietary. That means the King of England just gave some very important people a colony. Wow. Well, so we have a bunch of Europeans coming to a place they didn't know existed and really all kinds of reasons for doing that and lots of things, goals, end games that were perhaps very different. Indeed. And it's going to create um, eventually 13 separate colonies who for the longest time had no conception of being the United States. They always just thought we would project onward ever in the future being 13 separate nations. And that's part of the, uh, the, the history that's important to understand. And uh, by modern standard, it's a very messy start. And there's things to say about that because uh, for all of us, we have a lot of healing that must take place on a worldwide scale, which makes looking at these documents relevant uh, today. But in the American story, that is the beginning of the European migration, although not by any means all of it. There is the small but significant immigrants who paid their own way. Uh, Most of this group were small farmers, but if they paid their own way, they would have had to have been wealthy. Many likely had a stake in life back in the old country. Then there was the much, much larger working groups, slaves and indentured servants. Indentured servants would be the tens of thousands who borrowed money for their passage and then worked it off once they got here. Uh, In the proprietary colonies, the uh, proprietors needed people to work their property and offered inducements to get people to come and basically work for them. And I would like to point out that this country has always had a shortage of workers, (laughs) which is going to lead to this indentured servitude and slavery that we'll practice later on. I mean, in Pennsylvania, for example, it's estimated that two-thirds of all the immigrants before the revolution were indentured servants. Being a bond servant was not good. You were treated like property, and it was not involuntary servitude because no matter how awful your master was, and many of them were, you always knew one day you were going to be free. And this, of course, is very different from those who came here as slaves. In the beginning, this was actually mostly white people. Men, women, and children would be kidnapped off the streets in London and brought here. In 1627, over 1,500 English children were recorded to have been shipped to Virginia alone. 
this is very much like modern day slavery today. Uh, it was criminal and it was unsanctioned. And during this same time period, they were only beginning to develop the slave trade from Africa. In 1650, Virginia had about 300 slaves in the entire economy. A colony. Of course, that was clearly getting ready to change when slave traders began to understand how profitable that trade could actually be. And by the beginning of the American Revolution, this number would blow up to over half a million of African slaves. And in the South, the slaves were nearly equal or exceeded the number of whites. Uh, but there was slavery in every colony, even in New England. And one of the 50 uh, people, one in 50 people there were black slaves. And this involuntary servitude was legal and that was sanctioned and hard for us to even visualize or wrap our brains around today. And of course, I have to ask about the indigenous or native populations here in America. Well, there's not much positive that you can say about that. No one knows how many indigenous people were living here in those days. We do know today that there are over 570 registered indigenous populations and another 300 plus that are not registered, but still exist today, uh, spread out across the American landscape. And historically, there have been a few highlighted incidents of friendships between the native populations and the incoming European settlers notably Squanto and Samoset teaching the pilgrims the ways of the wild. But William Penn had a positive relationship with native peoples. But as we look back, the story is bloody and painful. And again, this idea of healing from historic trauma is important and in large part comes from understanding history. Uh, there are actually a few historic documents from indigenous populations that have made their way into the North American canon, like the Iroquois Constitution. Uh, that would be interesting to do in a podcast someday, even though most were originally oral narratives. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, and of course, this is where history and literature, we can see they are very much entwined and oh, complex. Absolutely true. And it, it really takes eyes of grace to see the world as it existed at that time period in the eyes of those who lived in it. Uh, most immigrants coming to America were marginalized people in Europe. They had no safe place. Uh, think about why most people would even immigrate today. You're escaping persecution, uh, political, religious, or economic persecution. And America was a place, uh, not uninhabited, but for lots of people that simply didn't matter. You have to remember that for almost all of human history, planet Earth is barbaric. Just watch recreations of, you know, shows like Game of Thrones or read any stories from anywhere in the ancient world. So it's helpful to look at history and historical documents from an evolutionary standpoint. And I think that's very important. We're all a, a, a species desperate for survival, and that's instinctual. And uh, the colonists were one group among an entire planet of groups engaged in the business of survival. And that involved conquering, building, struggling. And this particular group we're highlighting were primarily English by nature, English by literature, English by law, and English by religion. The majority of these coming to America were religious dissenters, and they were critics. They were not friends of the Church of England, uh, and they were under the authority of the crown. And most were not really political people, but even that language is modern. There's really no way to be a political person on a planet where there is no political choice. In the case of most peoples during the time period we're looking at, there was a feudal system in Europe, and you were born into a social class with very little hope of moving up. Uh, and since 1215, the English have been slowly moving towards constitutionalism, which is an idea we'll explore in this series. And the colonials have inherited this English tradition and combined it with a wilderness frontier society whose survival was always at risk. And as a result, you're going to get the unique experience here. Um, however, in this particular case, as we see history develop in the Americas, the monarch was far away. In America, if you were a newly freed bond servant or a free man of any kind, you were pretty lucky. You had to be self-reliant to carve out a place in this world, this wild world, or you would literally die. But at the same time, you didn't have anyone controlling your life or your destiny. You were able to change social classes. Uh, of course, not all people here were free. And this is, as we know, will come to a breaking point. And of course, as we mentioned, the story of indigenous peoples will be devastating. But for persecuted Europeans looking for a shot, America was basically 
unsupervised. I mean, free trade existed nowhere else on earth, but it did in America. No one could control it. This wild, wide open environment created a unique culture where a new idea was launched. And this idea would be an American version to the French idea of liberty. And it will turn out to be an evolutionary and strange idea in a lot of ways and unnatural and almost impossible to actualize. So I guess it's this idea that it's possible that there might be a way to construct a set of parameters, agreed upon principles, this idea that individuals could change their own destiny without a class system, without a caste system. And this would include self-government, self-mastery, self-control, duty, personal responsibility, and honor. Uh, It was a promise that people actually could live peacefully and have a say as to the direction of their lives. And this was an entitled gift from a transcendental God. And the idea was, it didn't even matter if you believed in this God. Of the 6,000 years of human history up to this point, nothing like what we're about to see has ever happened, which I find interesting. So is the American Revolution story a group of perfect people building a utopia? I think that would be amateurish to even nod at that idea. But it's not a monstrous people building a system to systematically destroy the planet either. Uh, This is where you have to let go sometimes of this arrogance that we have in the presence. It's the story of human genius, but it's not fiction. The historian uh, William Andrews calls it a promise with a paradox. The ideal of liberty, the founders would say, is a divine idea. A young Alexander Hamilton from Barbados would say, the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They were written as a sunbeam in the whole volume of human destiny by the hand of divinity itself and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. The implementation of this idea, unfortunately, would be done by mere mortals, and that struggle is ongoing. The mission would be life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people. And this is going to become the driving force, and it will be and has always been controversial. The founding fathers themselves, as they extolled these values, often questioned their own commitment to them. We also know from their private writings that most were very much aware of the contradiction in terms that they were actually living. They knew things weren't equal for everyone, and most of the contradictions, sometimes they couldn't even identify. Well, that's normal. Most of us, most of the time, can't even see our own contradictions. Uh, A country which is a collection of so many different voices, as we see all the time, could never agree on anything. And and that's assuming everyone uh, has good motives, which, of course, is not possible. It's just so very hard to build, and it's so very easy to destroy. But it does happen, and I would suggest that the American story is one where we can see the evolving definition of this concept of liberty, and it's honed generation after generation. And if you take nothing else away from today's podcast, you have to at least grasp the concept of liberty. It's central to everything we're looking at today. Okay, so uh, are we ready to look at this document, Patrick Henry's speech at the Virginia Convention? We've set up, you know, the first couple hundred years of American history, but now we're going to get to one individual. (laughs) Who's Patrick Henry, this guy? He's absolutely foundational to the development of political thought in this country. I mean, he's a native-born Anglo-American, born and raised in the backwoods of Virginia and living that basically unsupervised life in that open range that was talked about. I mean, hunting and farming and eating off the land. He did not have any kind of formal education. He was taught by his father to read and write, but by all accounts, he was not a great student. At the age of 19, he married 16-year-old Sarah Shelton, called Sally, and they started married life where he'd have six children with her before she died, a very tragic death, while her husband was governor of Virginia. And that was not uncommon for that time period, but that's jumping ahead a little bit. Henry was not a great farmer. He was not a great businessman. And long story short, he's going to become a lawyer. (laughs) basically by lack of options, although he only had something like a six-week course on the subject of lawyering. 
And where he gets his big break is in a case called the Parsons Cause. And in the Parsons Cause, it involved the colony of Virginia basically passing a law governing how the clergy were to be paid by the state. And what happened and where Patrick Henry got involved was that the British government overruled the local American law. And in this case, for the first time, he will be arguing successfully that uh, the colonials have the right to govern themselves and that the crown does not have the right to overthrow local government. Pretty racy concept for the time. Ultimately, he, he finds his place in politics and finds himself involved with the infamous stamp taxes. Uh, there's a lot to say about this, but we really don't have near enough time to discuss all this. But it comes back to this. The American immigrants had gotten used to a lot of freedom and a lot of wealth building. And now, years later, over 160 years later, the British government wanted to try to restrict and make the colonial economy be subservient to the authority of the empire. Isn't that the theme of Star Wars? <laughs> it is. It sounds like also in parenting when you've let your kid live without a curfew and then he turns 18 and you say, okay, you got to start coming home at 9, 10 o'clock. And he hasn't done that before and it's generally not well received. It is not well received. <laughs> um, what Henry did in Virginia was to write seven resolves, basically laying out what was unfair about this arrangement. Uh, this leads to his making speeches in the Virginia House of Burgesses, laying out the argument as to why the Americans should tax themselves, make up their own laws, uh, and those ideas are going to show up in the Declaration of Independence. Well, he's obviously very persuasive and uh, becomes somewhat well-known through this to these discussions. Indeed. And basically, the Stamp Act became impossible to enforce, and that was repealed in 1766. So they were just putting stamps. You had to buy stamps for everything you bought, stuff like that. Yes. And even more importantly than charging the, the tax was we had clearly felt like it was an unfair tax because it wasn't locally imposed. And the British attitude was, we can do what we want. And the stamp tax reflects that. And so you're, you're engaging in this simmering battle of wills as to who has authority, the local government or the central government, which, by the way, is a foundational part of American history right there. The speech we're getting ready to read is his argument for what I tell students will become a precursor for the most famous breakup letter in American history, the Declaration of Independence. Um, he gave it in March of 1775 at the second of five Virginia conventions convened to decide if Virginia would join other colonies to defy British rule. And keep in mind, the confrontations at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts are going to occur just a few weeks after he gives this speech. And a side note, I want to point out Massachusetts is a northern colony founded on congregationalism, which is a precursor to self-rule. Virginia is a southern colony led by a wealthy aristocracy, and the wealthy aristocracy were the most resistant to Henry's speech at this time period. Well, I think Henry was a real radical and extremist uh, for his time. And of course, it's easy to see why it would be dangerous for a colony to try to leave the motherland. Well, this speech is eloquent, and the reason why we're interested in it today is, first, because not only did it change the minds of Virginians, but also um, it's going to serve as kind of a guiding philosophy for this new definition of liberty that was taking hold in the, the national psyche of the, of the Americas. Henry finished his speech with this now famous phrase, give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> which is the only phrase most people know of, of <laughs> yeah. his. Anyway, and as he delivers the word death, he picked up an ivory letter opener and he pretended to plunge it deep <laughs> into his chest. Very dramatic. The packed church just sat in total silence for a long time. The emotional reaction to what he said was so strong that one man asked to be buried at that spot because of it, and he actually was in 1810. So uh, more people were listening to the speech through the open windows than were even in the church. And I do want to say that we actually don't know if every single word of what we read today is original. The actual transcript has been lost, and what we have is a transcription from a biographer who collected uh, information from other people who were present during the time period. But apparently the words made such an, uh, an impression that it stayed with these people for years. So uh, 
before we read Henry's words, there are two absolutely indispensable ideas you have to keep in mind. If you don't, then this speech loses its power. Those two ideas you have to understand are liberty and freedom. And liberty comes from the Latin word libertas. It means unbounded and unrestricted release from constraint. And it contains this idea of being separate and independent. And freedom, uh, the history of that word, describes someone who belongs to a tribe or a group and they have all the rights and privileges that go along with that. So they did not look at independence as a quest for new liberties, but a revolt against a government bent on taking existing liberties away. Liberty is who they were. Well, should we start reading? I guess I'll start uh, the beginning and then uh, we'll kind of look at it little bit by little bit. So it starts off like this. He's talking not to the president of the United States, but the president of the convention. Because remember, there's no such thing as United States. He's going to say this. Mr. President, no man thinks more highly than I do of patriotism as well as abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed the house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights. And therefore, I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if entertaining as I do opinions of a, very, opinions of a character very opposite to theirs. I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the house is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God in our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself as guilty of treason toward my country and of an act of disloyalty toward the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly things. I do want to point out, uh, if we're going to look at the speech through the lens of what consists of powerful rhetoric, the first thing I notice is that he shows a considerable amount of respect for an audience that he knows is probably going to disagree with him. He doesn't use the tactic that if you are a good person, that means you think like me. He doesn't use name-calling tactics, and he deliberately does not degrade his political opponents. It's the opposite. He's going to call those people who he absolutely thinks are completely wrong worthy gentlemen. He even concedes the point that he may be considered disloyal to his country and even to his God for what he's going to say, but he has to believe that open-minded dialogue, even if you can't stand what the other person is going to say, is where you will find uh, whatever it is that he's going to talk about, that place of freedom that that we're eventually going to discuss. Well, and that's foundational to the whole concept of freedom of speech. His argument after all the kind words at the beginning gets very emotional. I mean, notice how he's going to reference Odysseus being deceived and seduced by Circe. He's also going to throw in some Bible references, but ultimately, and listen for this, his argument is something we should all do when evaluating anybody else's words. He says this, ignore everything the British say and pay attention to what the British do. Their words and actions don't match. When you feel like people's words and their actions don't match, go by the actions, not by the words. This is sound logic. So, Christy, read some more for us. Sure. He's going to say this. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. That's the siren you were talking about. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of that number of those who having eyes see not and having ears hear not the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future, but of the past. And judging by the past, 
I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves into the house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petitions has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our lands. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. Hmm, powerful. So I do see that he develops this very powerful, you're right, logic through a series of rhetorical questions and through a series really of biblical references. And these questions are going to make these points very emotional and the bible references are again to reference these things that he knows his audience would be familiar with so when he says something like don't be betrayed by a kiss he's clearly referring to the kiss that Jesus, Ju- Judas, not Jesus, <laughs> Judas gave Jesus before he turned him over to be crucified which is basically what he's trying to say we're getting ready to be crucified look at what they are doing. They may say they love us, but they act in a way that doesn't support the things that they say. And this is sound logic. I mean, I'm not there, but logically, if you if you follow what he's saying, he his point adds up. Gary, why don't you take a turn being Patrick Henry? Well, all right, I'll do my best. <laughs> I ask, gentlemen, sir... What means this martial array? If its purpose be not to force us into submission, can gentlemen assign any other possible motives for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose to them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last 10 years. Have we anything new to offer on the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves longer. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain, after these things, may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. And of course, what he's doing is he's chronicling the things from his perspective that they've done to try to restore this relationship. He says things like they petitioned, demonstrated, begged. So this is a literary technique. You know, when you take out all the conjunctions and you try to emphasize how long this list is of things that you've been doing. And he uses a lot of visual imagery. We've prostrated ourselves before the throne, of course, implying we've been the humble humble party of this relationship. We have done everything and of course nothing has been done to us uh, that has been anything but disrespectful this exact language and idea will show up in the declaration of independence Um, but before that look at what he highlights the british are doing the british have increased the presence of soldiers on the american continent they sent over more ships and he asked why would they feel the need to have so many soldiers and weapons and then you get to this emotional language. They are meant for us. 
They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. Well, it's very emotional language, and I can almost hear him escalating, you know, getting his tone higher and Mm -hmm. higher in my head. But really, if I were sitting there thinking, I would think, yeah, what are those boats doing here? I hadn't thought about that. Basically, what he's trying to say is we're in this trying to make this good faith effort, but they're not. They're beefing up on the guns. True. And, you know, when you teach the uh, colonial period, you do find out that the colonials are not innocent. (laughs) But But their rhetoric is very... um, Lofty. Lofty. (laughs) And keep in mind, this is the social media of its day. They're trying to... That's a good point. They're trying to influence. And that's what these speeches are about. So... um, I mean, if you believe that you must decide what you want to do, and for Henry, I mean, he sees it very clearly. He's going to lay out in clear language that we have to fight. That's the thesis. We must fight. Right. And and that's so much easier said than done. I mean, just to ask any people who have tried to stand up to the British Empire, uh, it had the most deadly technology. It had the largest armies, and it was the best funded military in the world. So it's not something to take lightly, and he knows that. And I want to point out one last thing. Thing. During our revolution, or around that time period, Irish rebels were fomenting a rebellion, and King George III passed a sentence on them that would have applied to the American colonials also. That means if you're captured, you are to be hanged by the neck, but not until dead. Before you are dead, you are to be taken down, have your entrails torn out, have them set on fire, and then they end the phrase. They end the sentence with the phrase, "And may God have mercy on your soul." <laughs> well, that's that what would be face. in my mind, and you know that he knows that's in the mind of the people that are listening. Because right at this point where he says we have to fight, he's going to turn to what we call a refutation. Or in other words, this the counter argument. So basically, he's going to say, "I know in your mind you're thinking about." all the things that could go wrong, like getting your entrails out or something like that. (laughs) But I want to refute that and and tell you what I think. And so the rest of the speech is kind of the answer to people who might be thinking, I don't know if I want to stand up to the British. That's pretty hard to do. So he says this, if we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve and violate these inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to ama- abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall abound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak. If we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature has placed in our power, three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty, and in such a country as that which we possess, are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanging may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. And let it come. I repeat it, sir. Let it come. So many great lines right there. And let me throw one in that's um, that I think is very interesting, too, from another statement by Patrick Henry, where he is advocating that maybe the king of England should have his own Brutus, (laughs) which was treason, basically saying wishing the death of the king of England. And he said, if it be treason, then make the most of it. Uh, So he's going to list several reasons why they should fight. The first reason is we better attack early because if we 
wait any longer, it's just going to get worse. I read that first reason, and for me, that wasn't very compelling. You know, you think yourself weak, so he says, well, it's only going to get worse. Uh, I don't know if that would convince me. Well, sure, I guess I should fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, for sure, and, and that's when he goes metaphysical. Um, he's going to basically make this argument. God is on our side. We have the moral high ground. Our interpretation of liberty is not made up by man, but by a divine right given by God. And since God believes in human liberty... He will fight for us in order to achieve it. Of course, that's very bold, and it's a little presumptuous to speak for God and, you know, say, I speak on God's behalf. I'm going to intervene. <laughs> well, it is. It is one that you could not make unless you knew your audience. I mean, he knew every person in the crowd believed in God to some degree, so it's a philosophical and a theological argument that would require great faith to really act on it. True, this idea that the other guy is bigger, but I have God. You have to think about story David and Goliath. So the British are Goliath. We're little right. bitty David. <laughs> well, and, and here's what's interesting. You have to have this context. Uh, the colonials were aware also that the British and the French are engaged in titanic wars around the world. So we're not going to face the full focused wrath of the British Empire, thankfully. And uh, I think Patrick Henley knows that Although these kind of arguments can be very moving uh, because we all want to believe God's on our side, it's not something that he can totally rely on. So his final argument is practical. Well, it's very practical, and it would be the one argument that I would consider because he's going to say, well, it's not just me. You can't avoid it. They're already fighting in Boston. And, of course, Virginia doesn't see itself as the same as Boston. I understand that. But his idea is you're getting dragged into this one way or another, so... What side are you going to be on? And we see this emotional apex. We're going to see more rhetorical questions. We see this metaphorical language as he talks about the chains clanging on the plains of Boston. And if you have an ear for poetry, there's a lot of um, sound devices here. There's repetition, alliteration, accidents, consonants, a little bit like we saw in Percy Shelley. Submission and slavery, that's alliteration. Clanging on the plains, it's assonance. Plus, he goes back to those biblical references, this phrase, peace, peace, but there is no peace, coming straight out of the New Testament of the Bible. The phrase, the battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. That's a uh, reference to Old Testament promises, which, of course, every person there had studied. This was the only book a lot of them even had. And the final paragraph, that's the one. That's the one you've quoted. That's the one that's so famous, so emotional, where he pulls out all the stops. Do you think you can do it justice? I shall try. I'm sure I cannot do it with a theatrical <laughs> You don't have a abilities. paper cutter either. No. <laughs> it is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> and scene. <laughs> there you have it. Give me liberty or give me death. Usually we would call this an either or fallacy or a false dilemma, if that's what you say. It's when you say you, there's only two options in the world. You either have this one, either or that one, or you're either for us or you're against us. And that's kind of what he's doing here. Usually when you have either or fallacies, it is fallacy. It's totally bogus uh, because usually there's a range of options in the world. Sometimes you can't narrow down all the choices to just two. But Gary, in this case, logical fallacy, or is he right? Uh, if you're for the Brits, then you're not for Americans. If you're for revolution, does that mean you're not for slavery or vice versa, <laughs> however he's trying to lay this out? I guess I'm saying, do you fight or, or are you enslaved? Is that really how it lines up? Not exactly. What's really going on? The American Revolution is really largely a middle-class revolution. And uh, he's trying to persuade the aristocracy of Virginia to join this very dicey, dangerous cause. So, uh, and 
you know, this question, every person in the colonies had to decide. And was it or was it not a false dilemma? Um, the history tells us that he made his case. And Virginia, after three more conventions, agrees with him and they join the revolution. Uh, but of course, that's just the beginning. And we'll talk more about that next week when we discuss the great breakup letter, the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we made it through. We did. Thanks for being with us today. We always like to encourage you to check us out on our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook. We'll see you next time. Peace out.